So uh, once again, uh, uh, thank you for being here today. Um, as Dr. Turnovic uh, noted, we're going to be starting uh, session two of her uh, uh, presentation. And uh, keep in mind, I still have these magic question pills on that. <laughs> so I have a, I have a, uh, a few of those as, as we go uh, go through. And uh, with that, I ask Dr. Turnovic to come back up. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone for sticking around. <laughs> okay, so after describing, I mean, all of our data collection effort and why we did it, now I'm gonna show you what our data show. Um, so after all of this extensive searching, um, we included and verified in our data 753 deadly mass shootings between 1980 and 2019. So recall that these are not only incidents that occurred in public spaces, right? So any event where four or more people were shot and killed are included. So compared to existing databases on mass shootings that extend this far back in time, like the Violence Project, for instance, we capture about five times more incidents. And so hundreds of these don't appear in any existing national databases on either homicides or mass violence. Um, so given, I know our, we located all of these, the first real question that we wanted to ask was, what does this overall trend look like over time, especially given reports about, you know, dramatic increases in recent years? So here's what our data look like. Now, each bar here represents the raw number of deadly mass shootings that occurred in a given year between 1980 and 2019. So as you can see, the trend is relatively flat over time, indicating that the, you know, the raw number of these mass shootings that occur per year has been somewhat stable over the past four decades. So it doesn't seem based on the information that we gathered that you know, mass murder by firearm is necessarily a new problem. Um, but rather, this has been something that has been occurring in American society for some time. Now, during any given year, the number of mass shootings ranges from 10 to 31. And as you can see, the most mass shootings of any kind um, occurred in 1991, 1993, 2008, and 2019. So, in fact, 2019 had the most mass shootings in our data than any other year. Um, several years of our data contain more than 20 deadly mass shootings, and you can see these tend to be relatively more consistent um, in recent decades. Um, so there is some evidence that these are becoming more consistent and more frequent in recent years, just not maybe to the extent that the media or existing databases would suggest. Now, when I adjust um, for the number of mass shootings by population increases in the U.S. over time, so when I create a rate of mass shootings, you can see that the overall trend tilts slightly downwards um, and that the rate of deadly mass shootings was highest in the early 1990s, although in general there don't appear to be many dramatic fluctuations um, in this rate over time, though. Um, you can see, though, also that the rate of mass shootings in 2019 was the highest that it has been since 1994. So in seeing these trends, um, the next question is, well, what do these look like? Like, in generally, like, what are these features of these incidents? Well, the majority of them are occurring in private settings with only 35% representing mass shootings <laughs> in public spaces. So a lot of these are instances of mass violence that are occurring in the home and private residences. Um, over half involve victims who were known to the shooter, so they were non-stranger related incidents. Um, and of those non-strangers, the majority of that category were family members, where family victims are, in are included in about 42% of the deadly mass shooting incidents in our data. Um, additionally, about 34%, oh wait, yeah, we're meant to partner killed. About 34% of these um, incidents involve, uh, they're felony related, so they're carried out in the context of another crime. These can be home invasions, armed robberies, gang related or drug related activities. And so this represents a solid portion of the data. Um, 
These incidents also overwhelmingly involve only male shooters, right? Although some female shooters are included in the data in 3% of incidents. Uh, the majority of these were of these female shooters were mostly family killings, although there were a couple who were co-shooters with their male romantic partners. Um, and in the majority of incidents, victims were killed by a single shooter, although we do have 16% of these incidents that involve two or more shooters. Um, in thinking of the victims, um, a large majority of incidents involved female victims, where about in 85% of incidents, at least one female victim was killed. Um, and in also about half of all incidents, a child victim was killed under the age of 18. Um, so these seem to represent a lot of, you know, family and known acquaintance related killings. Um, and these are typically not discussed in the conversation regarding mass shootings. Um, so looking to, given that a lot of these are occurring in private residences, we wanted to see where are the rest occurring. Um, you can see 35% of them took place some, in some other public place. Um, notably, only 2% of the incidents in our data involve school shootings. Now recall that 50% of incidents involve at least one child victim killed. And so in a lot of these instances of mass violence where children, there's child fatalities, there's aren't occurring at school, but rather in the home. Now, given that we included a variety of different types of deadly mass shootings, um, we also can look at some of the trends in these different kinds of incidents separately. So first I'll show mass shootings that involve family members as victims. Um, so these are raw counts, um, and you can see that these seem to be slightly more common in recent years, with the most occurring in 2011. Um, but note that these graphs don't adjust for population size. Um, just there, these events are so rare. Um, next, you can see the felony related mass shootings. So those that are carried out in the context of another crime are motivated by their crimes. And you can see that these were slightly more common in the early to mid 90s than today. And many of these reflect urban violence or drug related violence. And the year with the highest number of those incidents you can see was 1991. Um, here's the trend for public mass shootings that do not involve any family member victims and um, that do not involve other felony related motives. So these are that are not carried out in the context of other crimes. You can see here that the trend line is increasing, right? Where slightly, um, but you see like the, the increase reflects an average of just three incidents um, on average from 1980 to 2019. So these are the most rare kind of mass shootings in our data. Um, they do appear to be more common in recent years, and these are also the kinds of mass shootings that you see most commonly reported on in the media um, and in you know, high profile events um, that kind of dominate the news cycle. So in addition to kind of looking at whether these mass shootings have become more frequent in recent years, um, there are also questions concerning I guess the number of victims that are killed in these incidents on a given year, um, especially because, you know, in more recent years, some of the highest casualty events have occurred, such as those in um, Orlando and Las Vegas. Um, so we wanted to see um, whether mass shootings have be, are becoming more deadlier over time. Um, in our data, the number of victims killed per year ranges from 46 um, to 164, which of course that primarily being driven by um, the Vegas shooting, that upper bound there. Um, so we wanted to see, are they becoming deadlier in recent years? Um, so here's the raw count of the number of victims killed in deadly mass shootings per year in our data. So you can see that this trend is also slightly increasing over time, um, but with the highest number of victims killed being 1991, 2009, 2016, 2017, and 2019. So in recent years, you can see the, the total number of victims killed in these incidents is, is higher. Um, looking at the average number of victims killed per incident, we see that the trend is more stable over time up until more recent years in which multiple high casualty incidents have occurred. Um, so you can see here, you know, the average number of victims killed per incident is, is higher um, in recent years. So on average, six to eight victims killed per incident. 
And of course, that mean is being driven by the higher casualty events that have occurred. <clears throat> Now, we also wanted to look at various different features of these mass shootings. So, like I kind of mentioned briefly um, earlier, that we found that the majority of these were carried out using handguns, right? So 72% of these mass shootings were carried out using a handgun and not an assault weapon, which was maybe um, a narrative that is put forth by the media. And so when we think about policies that have been put forth to try and prevent mass shootings through the banning of assault weapons, well, that wouldn't affect um, the majority of these incidents. Um, in terms of like other types of firearms that were used, um, rifles and shotguns are also more common, um, rifles that were not assault weapons in these incidents. So assault weapons are only used in about 9% of our incidents. Um, in 30% of incidents, we see um, multiple guns being used by the shooter. Um, and so it's not just one weapon that's been used. In 35% of incidents, we found evidence that shooters used guns that they stole or that were obtained or possessed illegally. Um, so the, the majority of mass shootings were carried out by firearms that were legally owned and obtained by shooters. <clears throat> defensive guns were present in 16% of incidents, and we the, a defensive gun means that there were other people at the scene who had weapons or there was an exchange of gunfire. Um, and we did not see any kind of correlation between the presence of defensive guns and the number of fatalities that occurred. So we didn't see that this either increased or decreased the number of um, fatalities or the number of people who were shot and injured, which we also coded for in our data. Um, we also found that in 30% of incidents, the shooter committed suicide and the vast majority were committed suicide on scene. Um, so we also see a lot of narratives put forth about how most mass shooters are suicidal and indicated by their attempted suicide or actual suicide on scene. So um, in, a, in a large majority of our cases, um, the shooter did not commit suicide. We also coded for attempted suicide um, and still the majority did not attempt suicide either. So a lot of these shooters are apprehended, detained, um, and that's where we were able to get a lot of official records for those cases. Um, so suicide is a, a, a present factor in suicidality in some of these cases, but not all of them. Um, we also found that in 20% of incidents that there was evidence that the shooter voiced um, their intentions, motives, or plans to kill people ahead of time. Now, of course, given the advent of technology and social media, this was more prevalent in recent years where we could track that information more reliably um, and, you know, given that our, our increasing attention toward this problem. But even in some earlier years, we have people making pretty clear threats of their attempt to kill or harm individuals ahead of time. Um, but still, in the majority of cases, we couldn't find clear evidence that, that the shooter had planned or voiced these motives ahead of time. Um, in terms of other, you know, we like to call them, quote unquote, like warning signs, um, we found that it was notable that a lot of the mass shooters in our data had been arrested previously or had history, documented histories of violence. Um, over a third were noted to have clinically diagnosed mental health problems prior to the shooting, which again we defined as um, having a, being clinically diagnosed with a mental illness, so taking psychoactive medication, being institutionalized for mental health crisis or mental health problems, um, or demonstrating plans to attempt or actually uh, carry out or attempt actual suicide. Um, so keep in mind that this is a pretty restrictive definition that we use. Um, and we also found that uh, the majority of shooters that they were undergoing some type of recent stress or crisis. Um, and these we these were like a, acute crises. So if someone was consistently under financial strain or pressures, or maybe throughout their lives they had struggled with various issues, we didn't code that as something, an acute stressor that was new. So we coded for the presence of something that may be an, an additional strain or acute strain or trigger you know, in their lives. Um, so of those recent stressor crises, we kind of separated them into these different categories. So we looked at 
recent job loss, recent financial strain, um, recent separation or divorce, recent interpersonal conflict, or some other type of stress or crisis. Now, interpersonal conflicts were most common um, and other stressors typically included eviction, custody battles, recent contact with police, um, recent victimization, or some other personal loss like a death um, in the family. Um, notably though, separation and divorce was a very common aggravating factor in family-related mass shootings or mass shootings that involved the killing of an intimate partner. Um, but interpersonal disputes were probably, in terms of this recent stressor crisis, kind of the, the biggest um, pattern that we saw. Um, so in terms of, we dug deeper um, into some of these cases, especially kind of the family-related ones and the intimate partner-related ones to try and understand what was going on um, in some of those. And so given that the majority of shooters were male, this way, well, what is it that is unique about any of these cases? So we found that in a lot of these, as we dug deeper, that there were these kinds of perceived threats to masculinity that triggered a lot of the shooters. So where it seemed like shame and humiliation may have served as some motivating factors um, for them. So this idea like, because I feel small, I'll make you feel smaller, right? This kind of like way to kind of use violence to kind of make up for some, some masculinity crisis. Um, so a lot of threats to masculinity, grievances with intimate partners um, seem to be motivating factors for a lot of these acts of violence. Even if the, the target didn't end up being the intimate partner, there were a lot of these relational issues that were driving anger um, in some of these mass shooters. Now, the willingness to engage in violence, like thinking about how all, nearly all of these are committed by men, you know, there's a lot of literature that suggests that kind of violence is central to American like, notions of masculinity because, you know, you show that you're unafraid, that you're strong and powerful, um, and, you know, carrying out acts of violence in response to masculinity or, you know, these other crises may serve, you know, to make people feel like, they are overcoming that or they're asserting their dominance and power again. Um, so some men may use violence as um, a means of aggrieved entitlement, right? Where they attempt to avenge their sense of masculinity. Um, and the term humiliated fury has been used to describe violence perpetrated by men when they feel shamed, powerless, or lacking the control to which they may feel that they are entitled. Um, so there's some research that states that when abusive and controlling men are confronted with feelings of shame. Some of them may take this path of least resistance. Um, instead of acknowledging their own sense of powerlessness and maybe sitting with that discomfort, they blame others and use violence to achieve this kind of phony or often short-lived feeling of power and pride. So when you think about shame and humiliation and victimization as precursors for some of these mass shootings, this is one explanation that has been put forth for perhaps why that is. So I have one example of a case like this. Um, this happened in Channel View, Texas um, in, in the late 90s. Um, so I'll just kind of read this synopsis. So in November 1997, again in, in Texas, a man shot and killed his ex-wife, Gloria, and three men. That night, the man went to Gloria's apartment after she had indicated to him that she was open to or maybe hopeful about them reconciling. He'd hoped she would be alone, right? And he, they were gonna kind of maybe go and rekindle their romance. But when he got there, she was having a party with her roommate and three other men. It was apparent that everyone there had been drinking a lot. And the man agreed to stay, the shooter agreed to stay and drink with the group, even though he was uncomfortable with this situation. Um, and he said he felt humiliated when at some point during the party, conversations turned sexual. Um, his ex-wife Gloria, she had flashed her breasts to the group. She then went into her bedroom with two male party goers. Um, a short time later, she appeared with one of the men whose pants were unzipped and she announced that she had given him oral sex and she was going to have sex with other party goers who were still in the bedroom. The man um, then taunted him and upset. The shooter grabbed his hunting rifle from his truck and went back to the home where he continued to be mocked and harassed by the people there. 
Um, and Gloria's roommate threw a, a beer bottle at him and he fired his gun and then he can shoot it, continue to shoot and kill everyone at the home. Um, and the one roommate though survived. So this is an incident where you can see this shame and humiliation combined with this failed reconciliation, the flaunting of sexual encounters with other men and harassment by these other people at the party kind of culminated in this kind of intense like crisis um, or of masculinity for the perpetrator. And so I want to say that this is like a very strange and anomalous case, but in a lot of the incidents that are family or family related, intimate partner related or occurring in the homes, there's often some type of event of humiliation or shame or crisis that happens. And I can't say that the shooter had a documented issue of mental illness before. He did not use an assault weapon. He did not ha obtain his weapon illegally. And he did not go to the party with the intent of killing everybody there. Um, so when we think about how to break down these different types of incidents into okay, where we, how could we have intervened or points of intervention, it's really difficult to say here. A lot of these uh, um, kind of manifest situationally out of interpersonal conflicts. Now, of course, this doesn't represent the majority of all mass shootings, right, or all of them. They're different. But this is a case where there was four people shot and killed, but it's very different than the narrative and the way that we view other types of public mass shootings. And so it's important to be mindful of events like this as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we include if there was like excessive drinking or drug use by the shooter, um, and in some cases, especially where there it was planned, like yeah, in a lot of the family ones, yes, um, but the majority of them, no. Yeah. And again, we rely on also the reports. So, um, like toxicology reports we've relied on um, to try and get that information, especially in cases where the shooter committed suicide. Um, and, you know, there's no other official documentation after that, like in the court records. Um, but yeah, in a lot of these cases, even if shooters, did, we coded two for their pre-existing, um, like issues with alcohol abuse or drug addiction, and there wasn't a lot, but there was more who used drugs and alcohol because they were gonna, they knew they were gonna carry something out and they were like gonna numb themselves. Um, but yeah, I can't say that it's a major risk factor for these mass shootings, but we do see that in about a third of incidents that we seen found evidence that the shooter was intoxicated. Yeah. Yeah. Has there been other cases that are similar to this one? Yeah, many. Yeah, the family, the intimate partner and family related ones. Yeah, but you can see too, like if you translate this, this general idea of kind of shame and humiliation, um, outside of an intimate partner context, we still see that with people who may be humiliated at work, right, by their colleagues, um, and then they come back and carry out a workplace shooting. We see that in school shootings, right, with students who may be bullied and, and feel shamed um, and powerless. Yeah. What about, uh, there have been some people that, uh, I remember one case, introverts into the where they think that society, uh, doesn't like them, nobody's there for them, they're all by themselves, mm -hmm. that they have nothing left in them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that also another factor to where they look at, you know, I'll just pick up a gun, I'll just do this because nobody cares about me, nobody really cares about me. I mean, I think in some cases, certainly, yeah. Um, for us, you know, in trying to identify these broad patterns across all of these incidents, we don't necessarily see that, but it would require a far deeper dive into a lot of the case studies um, and to the shooter's different histories, um, which for this project, we were kind of looking at like, okay, just broad trends and, and these different ones over time. But I think that's certainly an avenue to explore. And for the research that has been done um, on mass school shootings in particular, um, where they really take just a, an isolated set of incidents and kind of try and dig deeper into the motives of the shooter. Um, the literature shows those patterns where people feel isolated, alone, disconnected from society. Um, we see this too, especially with incidents of radicalization and people joining like incel communities where they feel like, you know, 
in Tallahassee where I live, there was a mass shooting. It wasn't a deadly mass shooting that was included in my data, but there were um, several people shot, um, two people died. Um, this was in my community near my home, and the person who carried out that was involved in the incel community. He felt shunned from society, he felt like rejected by women, and so he went to the hot yoga studio to like carry out his um, rage on them. Mm-hmm. And another thing, one more. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of it, is there a lot of data that shows that there's men that think that they've been rejected by women? Yes. And just go and shoot several women in certain stalling locations? Yeah, there is, um, yeah, I think the hot yoga Tallahassee shooting, FBI just uh, released a, a report on that actually. Um, but yeah, I think the incel movement is, is, is growing. Um, and there's more research to be done on that for sure. Um, okay, so just to, like some key takeaways here, just given what I've presented so far, and I'm happy to have, you know, much more discussion on this, but I think the key things that we want to say are that based on these data that deadly mass shootings don't really appear to be a quote unquote new problem. They're framed that way. And when we were searching for some of these incidents and we had to use, you know, different keyword searches, we couldn't, the term mass shooting really didn't become popular or common until recent years, really post Columbine. Um, And so there's a reframed as a new social issue, but they've been around for quite some time and they don't appear to be going away either. Um, We don't see any stark increases or decreases in the frequency of mass shooting incidents over time, although we do see that they're occurring with somewhat greater consistency in recent decades. Um, Most of these occurred in private residences. A large portion of them were family related, right, which also do appear to be increasing in recent years. And there's been relatively new recent research that has come out, not necessarily on mass shootings in particular, but on gun related violence and homicides um, that show that mass that violence has increased in private residences, especially during COVID um, and that domestic violence also went up during COVID when people were in their homes. Um, felony related mass shootings we see have somewhat declined over time and these were more common in the 90s right when there was a lot more gang and drug related violence that were occurring occurring in urban areas Um, public mass shootings we see to be much rarer than family and felony related shootings and they do also occur with somewhat greater frequency in recent decades um yes i know we're i don't know if you covered it Mm -hmm. maybe i just missed it do we see a correlation between the age and race of the mass shooters, because I know the ones that are widely reported, right, by, like you say, CNN, uh-huh. uh, the major news outlets, they paint the picture of an aggrieved white male uh-huh. as, the, as the shooter, you know, who has a problem with new wave new yeah. policies, new wave ideas. Yes, yes. Um, does that actually fit the narrative? Yeah, so I didn't present that in this presentation, but I, I can pull from our report that I produced. Um, so 46% of our mass shooters were white, um, 29% were black, 12 were Latino, 4% were Asian, um, and 4% were other race. And in 9% of those, we could not reliably identify the race of the shooter. Um, but yeah. So in the majority, the most, the largest category of shooters were white. Um, so 46%, but we do see more racial diversity in shooters than what you would typically expect based on media reports and on other public mass shooting databases. Mm-hmm. A lot of the mass shootings that are those mass public attacks appear to be carried out mostly by white men. But when you look at the broader spectrum, there's a lot more racial diversity. And in terms of the age of shooters, the majority of them were between the ages of 30 to 39. That was the largest age category. Um, so we see like 6% of them were under 18, um, 25. And again, these are not mutually exclusive categories because some we have multiple shooters, but 25% were 18 to 24, 20, about 19% were 25 to 29, 26% um, were, oh yeah, 25% were, sorry, 18 to 24, 90% were 25 to 29, um, 26% were 30 to 39 and then yeah, smaller categories after that. Yeah. So we see mostly that kind of 18 to 30, mid 30 range mm-hmm. as most common for mass shooters, which is, you know, what we would expect based on perpetrators of violent crime generally. Yeah. Homicides generally. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as part of your study, uh, mm -hmm. okay, do you have an opportunity to actually interview or hear videotape of other interviews regarding what makes them tick? What, what makes them, and what was the percentage of them? Oh my gosh. Um, so in our official records, like we have 70% cases where we have official records, um, but I don't have a count of like those, like if we had actual taped accounts from shooters. Um, and, and some of those we not always um, would view as reliable because a lot of some of those interviews are occurring during like a trial process where, so we have like, there's one incident in our data where um, the shooter and his lawyer were trying to say that he ha was really mentally ill and he was hallucinating the whole time. And he had done these series of interviews saying how he sees things and hears things and it's like all of these delusions. And then you had other jailhouse informants saying that he's bragging about faking mental illness. So we're like, we, I don't know if we can trust this. Um, so there's stuff like that that has happened. Um, but we have, there's been a variety, like for some of the official records that we've got, some of them range from, you know, handwritten police reports, especially from the earlier years, to some entire case files where we've heard 911 calls. We see crime scene photos. We see summaries of autopsy reports. like really rich information, um, but there is variability. Yeah, there's variability there. Um, some of my other key takeaways too, just to recall, the most common weapon used was a handgun, right? And a lot of these were possessed legally. And so by comparison, an assault weapon was, we confirmed that to be used in only 9% of incidents. Um, in around half of all cases, the shooter had some type of confirmed documented history of violence or an arrest record. Um, in over a third of all cases, we see the shooter was documented to suffer a clinical mental illness. Um, deadly mass shooting victims we found to range widely in age, much more widely in age than shooters themselves. Um, but again, in half of all incidents, at least one victim killed was under the age of 18. Um, hundreds of mass shooting incidents that we identified simply do not appear in any existing databases. And so to the extent that, you know, anyone is interested in doing, you know, one of a more qualitative deep dive to kind of find out more about the precursors and nature of these incidents, it, it simply has not, not been done. So there's a lot of opportunities to learn from these cases that have really been excluded from public discourse. Um, and also, I want to say, you know, open source data collection methods, they're not perfect, right? But given what we had to work with, this was kind of the best available data that we could find and, and gather. Um, so some characteristics, of course, may be underreported um, given the way that we collected this information. And so clinical mental illness, right, that we coded, that doesn't capture maybe perhaps undiagnosed mental health problems that were present prior to mass shootings happening. And you think about things like masculinities and these aggrieved entitlement. I mean, that also correlates with not wanting to talk about or share or seek help for maybe mental health problems as well. Um, and so it could be that those kinds of characteristics may be slightly underestimated based on these data, but we didn't want to overestimate. Um, and so we wanted to just rely on the mo most valid information that we could. Um, so moving forward, um, I think there's several avenues of future work and you all actually touched on these already, right? Where I think there's probably a need to expand some of our definitions of mass violence, where there's incidents where multiple persons were shot, maybe 12 people shot in an event, but one died. And that would not be captured in our data, but that's a serious public safety threat, right? So we would probably wanna use these as a starting point and then build off of them to add other incidents of, of mass violence that involve maybe not just four or more fatalities, but also multiple people shot and perhaps injured. Um, in thinking about warning signs and red flags, it's really important here to remember that correlation is not causation. So many people undergo stress and crisis in their daily lives and never resort to any violence, nonetheless homicide, nonetheless mass murder. And so we have to be careful in maybe over predicting threat in some instances. Um, but we also don't want to ignore some of those warning signs either. So it's a very difficult 
line to walk with over predicting threat and then maybe having someone suffer consequences, especially like in a school setting when we think about red flags and warning signs um, and maybe over policing and monitoring a child because um, we think they may be at risk for carrying out violence at school, which they never will. And maybe there's <coughs> other consequences to that. But again, just remember here, correlation is not causation. These are just a subsample of incidents. Um, and we're just looking at the prevalence of some of these characteristics. I think with respect to questions such as gun laws and like open carry policies, and um, I think there's a lot of questions to be asked about whether they play a role at all in preventing these mass shootings or perhaps, you know, indirectly contributing to them in some way with the more availability of guns. The research just isn't there and in part because there hasn't been data that goes far back in time with enough cases to really reliably examine that. So with these data, there's an opportunity to do so. Um, to look at how changing gun laws and areas over time um, have maybe correlated with whether some of these mass shootings are more deadly or occurring more frequently in various years. Um, I think there's also a lot to explore with how features of mass shootings have changed over time. So thinking about like leakage and, and um, you know, leaking your plans to carry out these instances, um, instances of violence, you know, social media has played a large role in, in preventing and detecting some of those threats. Um, and so, and this is very different than in prior years. There's also things that have happened in recent years that are unique from prior years. Um, and you think about like the pandemic and COVID and even the sensationalization of crime and how that may lead to like copycats and people trying to mimic mass shootings in the media. I think these are relatively newer issues compared to decades past that we can see if, you know, the features or risk factors for these are, are evolving over time. Um, I think there's also a need, of course, to expand the years of data to stay current, right, on the nature of this problem. Now, me and my, my team of students, like we're only so much uh, and we can only do so much with our, our time and resources, but there's definitely a need to kind of keep these data current um, so that they continue to, again, influence policy. We think of things that have happened since 2019, COVID, right? Other instances of violence and a lot of stress and crisis that people have experienced during that time. Um, and those are not reflected in these data. So there's a need to kind of stay updated and stay current on that. Um, but yeah, a lot of opportunities, I think, to expand the data and to look further. Um, so that's all that I have, and I, I'm happy to have more discussions and questions. Um, and yeah. Mm -hmm. So how is Dow's research presented to lawmakers, like particularly when we have a change in the administration mm -hmm. federally who are yeah, so I've I've given a very similar presentation that I just gave you all to Florida state senators. And in Florida, you know, after Parkland, there's been a lot of initiatives to try and you know, um, pass different forms of legislation to prevent acts of mass violence. So red flag laws, and then also limiting kind of the age at which people can purchase weapons, like increasing that age. Um, so I think for me, as just someone who is, I try and present the data objectively as a neutral party, um, and people can always attach their own political uh, biases and motives to these how they want. Um, but for me, what's important is that I'm giving people more evidence and data on a, on, on a problem that they may not understand all that well. And especially with cases of mass violence, you know, people are relying very limit on very limited case studies to make wide sweeping policy changes. Um, and so here, my goal is to really just provide them a fuller scope of the picture to say it's maybe not that simple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. John, in your advice of the what surprised you the most? I mean, I, we've been, oh, We've been surprised so many times with these, but I think one of the most shocking things for me and just carrying out this entire project is how so many incidents we've are of mass violence we've never heard of or have received much attention at all by media, by policymakers, um, or even like lobbyists, right? Who are trying to lobby one way or the other for certain issues. Um, 
so for some of our incidents, we were only able to find a total of four news articles. And it was like four victims found shot and killed in a drug house in Baltimore, period. And like, that's it, you know? So there was such widespread variability in the way that cases were discussed and presented on based on who the victims were, their characteristics and behaviors, the neighborhoods and contexts in which the shootings happened. Um, so we have a lot of instances of people who were, you know, maybe engaged in illicit lifestyles, they maybe were transient or they have, you know, drug issues and their case is just like not discussed, right? Or given a lot of public sympathy or by extension resources and kind of like political uh, motives. And and so I think for a lot of the, it's just, it, that to me was, was really challenging um, as a researcher trying to find information on those cases. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of shocking ones that just, you know, when my students and I would get together and talk any week, every week, you know, this is such a dark issue, but we would be like, What's the weirdest case that you read about, right? And I mean, there's one that's like, you know, this old man in his retirement community, he like he was a neighborhood curmudgeon and his neighbors didn't want to hang out with him anymore. So they didn't, they're like, you can't golf with us. You know, we're golfing without you because you're like, you suck. Like, we don't want to be around you. And he went nuts and he shot all of them, you know? So they're like, these, there's cases like that where you're just like, what the hell, you know? A lot of interpersonal disputes, neighbor disputes. So going into this project, I too assumed that the most of these would be kind of these public premeditated attacks. And to see that so many of them were stemming from, again, relationship problems and interpersonal disputes was eye-opening. And I was like, okay, these look like a lot of the homicides, everyday homicides that um, we study. So, yeah. Yes. So I heard you mention that that through this research, there's a lot of instances where there was underreported incidents. Yeah. So through the 39 years, have you found a particular point in time when there was more incidents that were underreported? And do you feel that the data that you collected would be able to help convince HCs to change policy, to force them to report yeah. more of these and more data into it? Yeah, I, in the, in, with respect to the latter question, yes. And so in Florida, I, I'm fortunate in my college, we deal a lot with local law enforcement agencies because that that is like the heart of the data, right? And so I think there is a push to say like, yes, report, and these are the benefits of reporting and releasing this information. Um, so yeah, I hope so that this project has, has done that. Um, what was the first part of your question? The, oh, the reporting. Yes. yes. So um, I think when we see a lot of, especially post Columbine, there's a lot more sensationalization of these events. Um, and prior to that, there's there was many incidents that occurred prior to that time that look very similar in their nature and features and characteristics, but they're just not talked about in the same way. Um, and so, but we still see even in the 80s, like reports of debates about is it the mental health of shooters is it a gun problem that we have is it you know like there's still these political debates happening in, and some of the reports that we found the news articles if i blinded the year and showed my students and say what year do you think this article was written they'd be like today and you look at it, it's like 1984 right so um there's I see a lot of cycling of the same rhetoric and same kind of back and forth debates about what causes these things with not a lot of um, resolution with respect to that. But I think trying to characterize them as either carried out, oh, this is a, a gun problem or this is a mental health issue. I don't think that's very productive and it doesn't seem to have been over the past several decades. Um, but yeah, so we see, of course, better reporting of some of these incident incidents in more recent years. Um, so we're always aware that there could be some bias with respect to our, some of these trends just basically reflecting availability, availability of us to find more information on those incidents. Um, but in terms of the features of those that are under versus underreported on, we still see like today, even still like recent cases, St. Louis uh, house people found burned and shot in like a, an, an, a known drug house is what was set, reported on um, like just maybe eight news articles. So those biases in reporting I think are still pretty prevalent over time.
I hope that answers your question. Yeah, in the back there, and then I'll go back to you. Yeah. Awesome presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I forget where I read the stat. I'll mark this heavenly model. Oh, I know the one you're talking about. Yes. Or it was John Mott. The stat was about 93% adaptive shooters and I don't know if Right. Ninety-three percent of active shooters, have, uh, in addition to having you know, the, the personal crises mm -hmm. or you know, the causes, also came from fatherless homes. Is that a statistic that you incorporated into your data? Yeah, so we coded for any like kind of childhood adversities that we could find. Um, so a lot of what we could find was mostly on on like child abuse. Um, but we didn't find evidence of that, but we also had a really hard time finding information on the composition of their childhood families. So the stat, like we found a very low percentage of that, but we also had so much missing information that I don't feel comfortable saying for sure one way or the other. But I can say with crime generally um, that, you know, we do see, you know, family dysfunction or, you know, divorce or separation or experiencing a death in the family or parental incarceration, you know, those are risk factors for, for crime and, and other crime related issues in, in the life course. But, um, but mostly because of just a lack of social support in their lives. Um, and so to the extent that that is a risk factor, it can also be pretty easily mitigated by other like support and mentoring programs for youth. Um, so I'm hesitant to say that's a major kind of risk factor, but that's an interesting um, statistic though. Yeah, so we, um, we mostly just coded for like evidence of um, childhood abuse or victimization. That's what we could refine the most reliably, especially in um, official records. But yeah, that's something to look further into for sure. Yes. Um, so when you were coding for the, that 30% of shooting suicide, yeah. did you include uh, code for suicide by cop? Yes. So um, I have that actually of how many. So we, in terms of those who were, um, we have a separate indicator for who was killed so that we didn't capture that form of suicide as suicide by cop. Because sometimes it was difficult for us to determine people who were killed because the law enforcement may have arrived and then they continued shooting at them versus whether that was something they had planned in advance. So the suicide that we captured in that statistic was their own self-inflicted suicide. But in 6% of incidents, um, our shooters were killed um, either by law enforcement or by someone else. So 3% of them were killed on scene by law enforcement and only 3% of incidents. So a pretty low percentage um, and then about 3% off scene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you see any specific clusters in drug jurisdictions or drug country? Um, so I'll tell you where, like obviously, thinking about population size, like the most mass shootings are occurring in the largest states, right? So over time, California, Texas, and Florida had the most number of mass shootings. But when we actually adjust for the average state population size and increases over time, the states with the highest mass shooting rates were actually the more rural states, right? Because any incident there like is, is pretty significant. So states like Alaska, North Dakota, and Wyoming had the highest rates of mass shootings, even though they're a very rural states. Yeah, so in the more populated states, the more number of mass shootings happened, but the rate um, for population size really wasn't that, that extreme. Um, the only state that didn't have a mass shooting in any of these years was Rhode Island, but every other state had a mass shooting at least one. Yes? We know we're doing their information on the domestic mass shootings. Mm -hmm. Were they coded differently when you pulled them? In other words, so four people were dead in the home, killed by what other, uh, mm -hmm. whatever family member that wasn't coded as a mass shooting at the time. Is it double coded in the database as both domestic and a mass shooting? So all of these are mass shootings for us. Every single one is a mass shooting. We only coded whether it occurred in a private place or not, 
Um, and we have multiple location codes for each incident. Um, so 65% of them occurred in private residences, but those not, were not only family related. Like some of those were home invasions and there were drug houses, um, things like that. Um, we didn't double code. Um, so we had mutually exclusive codes for things like whether it occurred in public or private for some of those cases. But given that some of them involved multiple victims killed in multiple residences, um, yeah. But, but how were they coded in the database originally? We created the data from scratch. So everything is a mass shooting, and then we coded for each characteristic. Were there victims killed in private? Were there victims killed in public? Um, were the victims killed intimate partners of the mass shooters? Were the victims killed family members of the mass shooters, children of the mass shooters? All those characteristics per incident. Yeah. OK. I saw that 16% of the mass shootings had like defensive firearms involved. Is that? Does that include if there's law enforcement intervention with the mass shooting, or is that just um, defensive firearms, like if somebody else who's there has a firearm? Yeah. So if law enforcement arrived on scene prior, like when the mass shooting was still active, we counted that as defensive firearms. Okay. If they arrived after the it already happened, um, that wasn't counted. Because we were trying to see, like, so after it happened, meaning, for instance, if someone was, if a victims were killed in the home, and everyone was already dead, and then law enforcement showed up, to us that didn't count as defensive firearms. If there was act an active shooter and there were still people around that could be potential victims and law enforcement arrived, that would be defensive firearms. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sean, do you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, um, of the glass, which is mm -hmm. pretty much, you know, it's, it's black across the yeah. years. Yeah. But there are several years that kind of stand out. Yeah. Um, in particular, most recently, it's 2019. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, um, do you, like, suspect that there are any reasons that uh, could explain kind of these off years? Yeah. Like 2019? I mean, I think there's always a hesitancy for me to say, okay, given things that were happening in one year, this is relating to increases in mass shootings. But given that this is a, a, a we've all lived through 2019 here, um, I think there was a lot going on. Um, a lot of stress, um, crises, you know, um, like political unrest. Um, this is still prior to COVID, but um yeah i'm not sure i would like to code over time to see if there are certain things that we can code for just like socially or politically or maybe pair with like general social survey data to see if any like attitudes or sentiments um or overall just feelings of stress and crisis or hopelessness may correlate with some of these trends or not but yeah mm -hmm. Can I ask another question? Yeah. So 9% of mm -hmm. the weapons were uh, assault weapons, Yes. Right? Um, but do you see any correlation between the use of assault weapons and uh, um, the number of victims? Yes. Yes. So of course, you know, it's easier to carry out a mass shooting um, when you have a weapon that's capable of firing, you know, bullets at a really high rate. Um, and so in the, the most... Um, you know, the incidents with the highest casualties, we do see that they're more likely to involve the use of assault weapons. Mm -hmm. It's just harder to kill that many people with a handgun. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a mom with mm -hmm. three kids, so mm -hmm. I'm most concerned with school shootings. Yes. Um, is there any trend in school shootings across the Do you see combat really kind of, you know, triggered? Um, yeah. Combat school yeah, so in these data, um, school shootings are really rare because these are just deadly school shootings um, or deadly mass school shootings, right? Um, when you look at school shootings generally, um, the tr depending on how you define it, whether you look at fatal or not, um, they're especially just people who fire guns on campus, like that is more common in recent years, especially post Columbine, right? I think schools have done um, a good job at target hardening, right? So like making schools more difficult to enter um, and making it you know, more difficult for shooters to successfully carry out school shootings. Um, and this is a place where, you know, there's been so much attention and discourse um, about this, but yeah, we don't see dramatic increases in school shootings over time. Um, they still remain relatively rare. 
Um, but in terms of like deadly school shootings in particular, um, but yeah, schools are generally safe places for kids, generally. Um, but I have a, another project right now with the National Institute of Justice looking specifically at serious forms of school violence and trying to better understand those precursors to see if kids who are at risk of committing violence in the community, if those are the same kids who are at risk of committing violence at school. Because if so, it suggests that there's a lot of different community-based and family-based interventions that can help prevent school safety in addition to things that just the schools do alone. Um, but that remains to be seen, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. How about the building? Okay. Yeah. So we coded for someone um, if if the shooter was involved in the military because we felt like there was some kind of we were seeing um, patterns of where someone was who was involved in uh, if they had served in the military before because there was several incidents, high profile ones in particular, where they were calling out instances of like post traumatic stress disorder. Um, and people just returning from combat or being discharged um, for some for, for instability or mental health issues, and then they come home and they're also not okay. Um, so when we're reading these, they seem to stuck out in our mind, like, well, this has to be a common trend. Um, I don't have the exact statistic in front of me, but I can give it to you if you want. But we did code for it, um, so we have that. And But it, a lot of the problems, so even if somebody did have um, time served in the military, there was still, it seemed to be some additional stress or crisis that happened when they were already kind of at their, you know, like kind of spent, like they didn't have the bandwidth or coping resources to deal with it because of their prior experiences, but it was still some of those more recent stresses or crises termed as kind of like a, an extra motivating factor. But I think there's a lot that can be done with support for veterans um, and support for, for mental health for that population, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry, this might be a bit of a stretch, but because you only focus on the United States, but mm. considering the research you've done for the yeah. for pain, how does our story, the United States story, match with this compared to or how is it told on the global stage? How yeah. So, I mean, I'm I'm a native of Canada. I'm Canadian, and so I'll tell you that this is not mm -hmm. this is not something we see there at the same scale, um, and so it's it's. It's different, but I think on a global scale where I've seen a lot of, you know, focus on, on mass violence is more on genocide and those types of issues. Um, and, and, but here in the U S I do feel like the nature of some of these attacks are quite, um, unique. Um, but there's instances of, you know, you think about global terrorism and genocide as also being, you know, instances of mass violence um, that are discussed quite separately from this issue of mass shootings. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think there's there's different cultural factors that play a role there. Um, and to the extent that some of those characteristics overlap with these, I think that remains to be to be seen. But there is a wealth of literature on, you know, terrorism and genocide on a, on a more global level. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have this question of uh, one of my teachers this week. I have a question, but mm -hmm. <laughs> is domestic terrorism attack same or similar to mass shooting? <clears throat> Um, it depends. So for us, we make no, we make for a mass shooting to be included in our database, we make no assumptions about the motives for that. It's simply, is this an incident where four or more people were shot and killed? So in some of these incidents, of course, they have could be motivated by other political factors, um, religious factors, um, you know, and, and carried out as an act of domestic terrorism or as a hate crime. Um, but those are not the majority of the incidents that we have in our data. Yeah. John, thank you very much. Thank you so much.